Good morning uh, again. <clears throat> Miracles. Why did I title the message this morning, Miracles? Well, I wanted to talk about several different kinds of miracles this morning. I'm going to tell you a few stories from the news over the last few years and give you some impressions of what I think are very miraculous occurrences, but you can judge for yourselves. 40-year-old <clears throat> Ruby Graupera Casimiro was going to be a mother for the second time. By all accounts, everything had gone normal through the pregnancy. She was scheduled for a C-section. It was uh, a September day. And she went in. The baby was delivered healthy, perfect. They did the, what do you call it, the close-up after the C-section. And by all accounts, we're going to put her back in her room for recovery. It usually is a couple of days with C-section, day and a half, whatever. And her heart stopped. Right there. The doctors did what they do. They, I think they call it a crash cart. They brought it in. They could not revive her. They put her on a breathing machine. A little louder, Grady. Gail's saying she can't hear me. At all. At all. Well, I can hear myself, so. <laughs> <laughs> and they went on and on. They worked on her. They did the paddles. They did the first day. They did they did a number of things. They worked on her <clears throat> over the course of nearly three hours. Now the interesting thing about <clears throat> Ruby is that at times there would be a flutter of a heartbeat on the monitor. Just a flutter. And the breathing machine was working, but there really was no regular blood flowing through her body. They kept at it, as doctors and nurses do. I mean, they're there to preserve life. And they fight hard for it. I know we see a lot of the TV shows, the doctor shows, and I think they do a pretty good job of portraying it. Having lost my father a little, what has it been, almost two years? But yeah. The doctor stayed in touch with us. We couldn't go to the hospital during his, his last two and a half to three weeks he was in there. That's where he died. But she, they kept us, she kept us well informed. The nurses Zamala would talk to were very informative. They really did a good job at telling us what was going on. So we know from the story, because this is well documented, it's where I got it from, that Ruby was in the best of hands. This was in Florida. I don't know if it was at our, our sanitarium or where, but maybe you should get the headphones, Gail, because everyone else can hear me. I don't want to be rude and leave, but I can hear just maybe a couple words from you. Can you get the hearing assist? I can't hear him at all. Maybe one or two words. Oh. Sorry. Maybe I should just quit coming to church. I can't, I can't advise you on that. So, 
Anyway, they kept working on her to the point where they were ready to declare the time of death. They called the family in. That's all we have to help with the hearing. So, and the nurse noticed on the monitor something happening. And then she looked over at Ruby and her eyes fluttered. Now, she hadn't had any heartbeat. Nothing for 45 minutes. I told you there was a little flutter that was indicating from time to time, but it had been 45 minutes since they'd seen anything that was just a flat line. So as I said, the doctors decided the time of death is and her eyes opened and she took a breath and the monitor spiked and start, her heart started beating. Now you might think, especially I know there's people that have been in the medical field that probably suffered some pretty serious brain damage, right? It's a long time without blood flow, without oxygen to the brain. None. By all accounts, she revived, was resuscitated, and has no impairment from the, from the uh, whole incident. They said that they're pretty sure the problem came from an amniotic fluid embolism. I don't know what that is, but apparently it's really serious. Very, very small percentage. The, the article said there was only like two other people who had ever recovered from it that they knew about. And she recovered on her own. This is a mortal impairment. It's deadly. And she recovered. Why? Have you heard any more about Ruby other than this incident? Why the miracle? We don't know, right? Is it a miracle? What are your thoughts? Our doctors say it's a miracle. She should not be alive. And if she had, been, if she had survived, she should essentially be without any ra rational brain function, right? 45 minutes. No heartbeat. That's my first example of a miracle. Modern day miracle. You have to be the judge if you really think it's a miracle or not. But I'm going to say that's one. Okay? Does it show that God works in our lives? Ruby's got some purpose. It may be for her family. It may be for her church. It may be 15 years from now. I don't know why he saved her. It may be for her husband. It may be for her children. She may not have any direct involvement in the reason why at all. Could have been for the medical staff. They may have needed to see a miracle. God is here to call us. And what did he tell? So, who was it? Somebody. I can use these stones to preach the gospel. I don't need you. God is calling each and every one of us and he's going to do whatever he needs to do at any time he needs to do it to make his point. Let's go back a bit. I, there's some 
older people in this room that I'm sure have heard the name I'm going to talk about next. He's a World War I ace. Anybody know who I'm talking about? World War I ace. He's had books written about him. I'll give you another clue. He was president of Eastern Airlines for a while. This goes back because obviously he was a World War I ace. Nobody? I thought sure somebody would know. I actually read his, his story when I was, I think it was in high school. It may have been college. It's a fascinating story. The man's name is Eddie Rickenbaker. No college degree, but a strong passion to get involved in World War I. He enlisted. He went over to Europe, started serving with the Army Air Corps, and just kept peppering his commander to get him flight training. I mean, just would not let up. And, it, and his commander <laughs> thought the guy was the best aide that he's ever had. He didn't want to give him up. He finally did. He relented. And Eddie went through flight training. Became a first lieutenant and started a fighter pilot training, doing all that. He became an ace in three months of combat flight, sorties. An ace, an ace in World War I was five enemy planes shot down in three months. Nearly unheard of. Eddie was something of a pilot. He was fearless. He became a squadron commander. He led Sorties, he went against five enemy aircraft alone, just dove into them, and he shot down one, wounded or injured another plane, and forced them to scatter to go back to wherever they came from. He shot down a total of 26 enemy aircraft in World War I, more than any other fighter pilot that I know of. That's not even the miracle. He survived that. That's miraculous in and of itself. World War I was no, no, nothing to be wanting to be involved with. But Eddie was one of those kind of guys who just kept going. So in World War II, he's not a fighter pilot, but he is involved in helping the war effort. So he's carrying communique down in the South Pacific and he gets aboard a B-17. You know what those B-17s were like, right? What do they call them? Flying Fortress, right? Amazing airplanes will fly virtually without, like with one engine or half a wing, or I've I heard so many stories about the B-17. Well, this one was not refurbished to the degree that it should have been. It was one of the older aircraft, and they lost their way. They, coming back from one of these islands in the South Pacific, the Compass went, I think the compass failed on them. Something on the aircraft that told them where they were failed on them, right? So they lost their way, kept flying and flying, and finally they ran out of gas. So the pilot had to actually set the, the plane down in the ocean. They had three life rafts and a few rations, some oranges. What else did they have? Like three bottles of water, some canteens. Anyway, the three life rafts were supposed to hold, <laughs> and Eddie laughed, or the way he told the story was not pleasant. Were supposed to hold five crewmen in one, three, and three. 
He said, well, the five crewman raft could hold uh, maybe three, and the three crewman raft were good for one, and they had to cram six people in these. So they were, there were seven aboard the, the flight. Unfortunately, one man did die when they set the plane down in the ocean. It was very rough. And then the other six made their way out onto these rafts. You've read stories about people who've survived, right? Um, shipwrecks and various incidents when in the ocean. It's difficult. You're dependent 100% on either what you have in your boat or what nature gives you. They had us some string, which actually Eddie gathered, and they had some hooks from something. I don't remember where they got the hooks. Just to give you a little more knowledge about Eddie, this is the kind of mindset he had. He's a Medal of Honor winner. He also has eight or had eight distinguished service crosses. France awarded him the Legion of Honor and two Croix de Grasse with Palm Awards. He's a thinker, he's a planner, and he's a doer, right? He gets things done. So he's in this, he knows the plane's going down. He gathers these few supplies that he can think of. He's the one that gathered the oranges, the canteens, and what supplies they could actually garner to put in the, the rafts. They tied the rafts together, so he got rope as well, so that they wouldn't get lost from each other and they could support morale and just hopefully they were a bigger bunch to see from the air hoping for rescue. It was uh, difficult. He... They floated on the ocean for, I think the story goes, something like 11 days getting by on those few things. They actually used the orange peel as fish bait. Didn't work. They were down to it. They, they hadn't had water, fresh water, for at least 48 hours. And a seagull landed on Eddie's forehead when he was sleeping, or close to him. And he gathered that sea, he grabbed it. He actually woke up and grabbed it before it could fly away. So they used the seagull now as bait. They caught some fish. Yes, they had to eat them raw. You can't build a fire on a raft, and they didn't have any other way to cook it, right? But now they had nourishment. And rain came. They actually used their, their vests that were inflatable. They took their water that they gathered and they used the tube and they filled the, the rain with water by putting it in their mouths and then spitting it down the tube back into the raft or into the air inflation vest. So they stored water that lasted them about a week. So very creative ways of survival, right? At like the 21st day, they're still floating around. It's three weeks. They caught, had caught some fish, they had gotten some rainwater, but it hadn't rained again for something, it was something like 10 or 11 days. So again, they're, they're getting down to where they have none. Well, the, the flight captain decides the best thing for them is for one raft to separate and start rowing in a direction where they think they can find island, something. It was a long shot. So they separated. The 22nd day, nothing. The 23rd day, nothing. 
So they decided to separate again. So now there are three individual rafts. On the 25th day, 26th day, a plane flew over. They didn't know whether it was enemy or friendly. They didn't care. They waved frantically trying to signal that plane. Well, the plane happened to be friendly, but they couldn't get back that day. They had flown something like 200 miles. So they came back the next day, on the 27th day, and it was a, a boat plane, and they actually landed it on the water, rode over to their raft, and pulled them in after 27 days. They rescued all three rafts. The first boat that had separated before them was spotted three days earlier and told this plane roughly where Eddie's probably would be. All six men survived. 27 days on the ocean. Why? Why is Eddie Rickenbacker, the hero of sorts of World War I, and why does he go on to help save five men and himself in World War II in a non-combat situation? Why does God put men like Eddie Rickenbacker in place? Is he a miracle? I have no knowledge that Eddie was a spiritual man. No knowledge in, in the stories I've read that he had anything to do with God specifically. But God puts people where they need to be when they need to be there. So when I'm talking about miracles, I want you to understand that miracles come in all forms. Eddie could have been part of the reason why the Allies won World War I. I don't know. But he certainly had an impact. He could have meant, meant something to the people of Eastern Airlines. He was certainly something to this B-17 crew. So that's my second story of a miracle. No, these aren't your traditional miracles, right? Well, maybe Jesus, when he turned the water into wine, wasn't giving us a traditional miracle either, right? Was it necessary to make the water into wine? No. But he did it anyway. That was his first miracle. The Spirit's leading, guys. That just came up. I didn't study about Jesus and the miracle with the wine. So, The next miracle. This one, I love this one. In Humboldt County, California. This is, I think, three years ago. A story. Amazing story. An eight-year-old, Leah, and her five-year-old sister, Carolyn, decide to go for a walk in the 80-acre woods behind their home. Their mom is tending to their two-year-old brother. Mom is there. She's not an inattentive mother. She told them, don't go anywhere. I've got to change your brother. She went into the house to do that. The sisters, the eight-year-old especially, had wanted to go on this walk because... There was something she was really interested in seeing again. I don't know if it was a rainbow that was happening. This is in Northern California, if you look up Humboldt County. So it's colder. It's in March when this occurred. They took off anyway. There were trails. They'd been on these trails many times with their dad. She thought, as an eight-year-old sometimes will think, we're only going a little ways and I can get us right back. 
We'll be gone for 30 minutes at the most. This will be good. It'll be all good. Five-year-old's like, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go for the walk with you, right? Well, as trails are in the woods, and as you're an eight-year-old, you're not quite as attentive to all the landmarks that your daddy's used to, they were lost inside of an hour. They circled around thinking that they could get back to where they needed to get back to and realized they'd circled, but were just as lost, if not more lost. So the search area, as I said, they were only going to go into this 80-acre part. Now, 80 acres is something... It's not a huge area, and yet every acre is about 46,000 square feet. So a square mile is 640 acres. So gives you an idea. It's maybe a quarter of a, a mile, but they weren't just in these 80 acres of woods. They had wandered apparently past that. So it's a large forest area to search. I want to give you all these parameters that came up in the story. Mom finally did. She reports that the children are missing. So search and rescue is called out. In today's society, unfortunately, questions about criminality have to be answered as well. Why, did, why are the children missing? It's a quick time frame. They, they go walking about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Mom had seen them and was with them at about 2.35. So she knows they could have left at 2.40. But she says they left at least at three. She doesn't know exactly. So. so they start the search. So the questions about cr criminality mean that not only search and rescue is involved, who else has to be involved? Legal. Sheriff's Department. Sheriff's Department actually has to report this to the FBI as well. Because if it's criminality, it could be a kidnapping case. And they have to investigate every possibility. So the clock starts and the manpower grows because two little girls decided to go for a walk. But we don't know that today, do we? When two children or seniors, we have silver alerts, right? When they're lost today, we start looking for them in mass. Have the children been abducted? Is there parental involvement? Sad, but that has to be investigated. A lot of people are searching and a lot of people are investigating. There were tips called in by concerned citizens. They had to be investigated. Both would have been indicated. Both of the tips would have been criminal situations. Fortunately, both tips turned out to be look-alike kids. The area had predators. They were concerned about bears and cougars. The search team itself included 270 volunteers. That's miracle number one, in my opinion. 270 volunteers getting together to search for these two children, two precious babes. State police, FBI, the rescue teams, the girls are missing 24 hours and the search continues. It's cold and wet. It's been raining. Hope is dwindling. They've been missing since, I guess it was 2.30 on March 1. Small signs that the girls have must have been in a certain area have been discovered. The searchers here, Dad, called out.
Still haven't found them. Now to the girls. Leah, the eight-year-old, did a good job. She found areas to protect themselves and keep themselves dry. She learned some of this from her time in the Miranda 4-H. So don't discount your kids, your grandkids, getting involved in groups because it can teach them self-preservation skills. On March 3rd, the girls are found under a group of huckleberry bushes. They called it their huckleberry cave. And it had kept them dry, but it also kept them hidden from the searchers. They were found safe, alive, and rejoined their parents in good health. Miracle? The miracle is not just that the girls are found. The miracle is that there's so many people coming together to search for them. Now you could say that would only happen in the United States. You could say it would only happen in Northern California. I don't believe that. I believe that people, when they see or hear about children, especially gone missing, they want to do what they can to help. They're moved to compassion. In Sabbath school, we, st we studied this morning about different resurrections. And when Jesus saw the, the woman whose son had died and they were carrying him down the, the center of the road, the procession, Jesus had compassion for the woman. And he went over and he raised that son back to life. Miracles. Nearly two full days for the girls. Another miracle that's very close to home, at least we feel it's close to a miracle. My wife's best friend, I'll give you her first name, Kelly. She's been diagnosed with lung cancer. And it's fairly serious. Um, possibly even in her trachea. Close to it. So she started undergoing treatment, radiation, and then chemo. After nine days, they've already done a scan and her tumors are 50%. That's, that's, that's miracle number four. The success of our medical knowledge is is so amazing these days but it comes because God said knowledge would increase but if you remember to pray for Kelly it won't hurt she's on the way to recovery we, we pray in remission cancer is no no fun We've all seen the suffering from it right here in this family. Elijah raises the widow's son from death. We talked about that in Sabbath school this morning as well. If you haven't read that story, it's, it's really amazing because Elijah goes away from Israel we think of the prophets as prophets to all of Israel, right? Was Elijah a prophet to Judah? No, he was really a prophet to Israel. This is when Israel and Judah are two separate nations. In fact, Israel and Judah have actually warred against each other, mostly because Israel hates Judah, and Judah just wants to defend itself. So Isaiah calls down, I say calls down, that makes it seem like Isaiah's got this power. Uh, Lord, let's have a drought. No, Isaiah prayed for the drought and the Lord decided, okay, maybe the drought will help 
the Israelites come closer, come back to me. But who is king of that time? You remember? He's not a nice fella, and he has an even un nicer wife, a nastier wife. It's Ahab and Jezebel. So, God does start the drought. It's pretty bad drought. It lasts for three plus years, right? Do you think that's a drought like we have had here in the desert? No, you guys have to understand this drought was no rain. They were using up their minimal supplies quickly. If it would have gone into the fourth year, I would dare say they would have had to start going to their neighbors and either selling themselves out as slaves or trying to conquer them. They were, in, they were getting to be in some pretty bad straits. Just give you the whole picture. Well, Elijah decides, I'm leaving the area for a bit. So he goes to where God tells him to, and he finds the widow and her son. The widow is in no better circumstances, right? The drought has affected her to some degree. Because Elijah is actually near a stream for a while, right? Before he goes to the widow's house. You remember that part of the story? What happens to the stream? Dries up. And God tells him, go to the widow. I have told her you are coming. So she expects him. And then, as we talked about in Sabbath school, he actually tells her, I need you to make me some food. I'm hungry. She's got enough food for one last meal for her and her son. And then they plan to die from starvation. One meal for two people. And it's probably a pretty spare meal. Elijah says, make that for me. If you make it for me, you won't have a shortage of flour or oil. There'll be plenty for you. She has to take that on faith. We, we, the, 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 spirit, or the scripture reading this morning is on faith. Does she do it? You remember? She does. That's pretty good faith right there, I think. She, she should get a reward of some kind. She does get a reward. Her faith feeds them for a while. Scripture says for several days. Could be weeks, the way it, it talks. Could be months. We don't know what the duration is for this this flour and oil that just every day there's enough for the three of them to have their meals. That's miracle number one, right? Pretty good miracle. Don't ever have to go to the, the, the local market. You don't have to go out in the fields and try to glean what isn't there in the first place. You don't have to go to the to try to get olive oil and or olives and squeeze out the oil yourself and I mean, it's it, it just there every day. It's like the manna showed up every morning, except for Sabbath. And then what happens to the widow's son? After her faith has supported her and she supported Elijah all this time, what happens to her son? He dies. Now, would that be the end for some of us? Oh, man, Lord, why me? Why did you do that to me? Why did you take my son from me? I did what you told me. I took in this prophet of yours. I gave him my last food. Sure, you've been feeding us for a while. I appreciate that, but you took my son. I have no way now of sustaining myself. He's my hope. He's my support. 
But did she do that? She's upset. She tells Elijah about it, doesn't she? It doesn't say Elijah had compassion on her, but do you think he did? You think Elijah's come to know this woman pretty well at this point? And come to know the son pretty well? That's the details we don't get in the story. But it has to be. People can't live close to each other without getting to know each other. Depending on each other. Searching for lost children. Going to war to support what they think is the right side. Or doctors saving a life in the hospital. They got to know each other. And Elijah, we have no record of this happening before Elijah. We don't know where Elijah got the faith to do what he did. We don't know where he got the instruction to do what he did and how he did it. But he went in and he laid on the boy and he prayed that God would give him back his life. And it didn't happen instantly, did it? Maybe his faith wasn't quite that of a mustard seed yet. But he didn't give up. He went back and he laid on him and he prayed again. And God granted his prayers and he brought that boy back to life. I'm going to just take us into our, our clothes. And if you would, you can open your Bible with me to John 14. I was 12 years old. And going through the baptismal classes. We had been through the evangelistic series something. It was in El Paso, Texas. And it was all about the end times. I don't know if you, any of you went through any of those evangelistic series. This would have been back in the 70s. It's a long time ago, but they were going on pretty regular back then. They were really spectacular, and they sure impacted me. But the pastor asked me, he said, you're only 12. What, what have you got to say about why you want to be baptized at this point in your life? And I told him, I said, well, Pastor, I believe what Jesus told us in John 14, 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, come on, say with me, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And that's the only miracle that matters to me. Coming back for us, guys. Amen. 